Hi, this is Jeff Custer, and welcome to the Bible class for the Fort Walton Beach Church of Christ. You know, if somebody were to ask you, um, is the church under persecution in America? How would you answer? Before you answer that, though, uh, think about what persecution actually is. Uh, if I were to say to you, think about why people are persecuted, uh, you might say, well, uh, people are persecuted to get them to back down from their religious belief. And I believe that that is exactly what is happening in America today. We would have to say, if that's the definition, then yes, uh, we are under persecution. Now, if you think about it, uh, we're not under persecution in the sense of the first century, because in the first century, a person could be stoned to death, or they could be drug out and uh, of their homes, and uh, they could have their heads cut off, that sort of thing. In that sense, you might have been tempted to say, no, we're not persecuted. But we are under attack. And uh, society, the culture that we live in, really wants us to back down from our beliefs. It wants us to accept the social norms uh, and, and not to stand in opposition. And so uh, in this period of persecution, in this period of attack, uh, we need to be called to have some hope. And that's what this class is about, to have hope in a uncertain time, uh, to be securely established in the certain hope of Jesus. And so uh, the title of our class is Certain Hope for Uncertain Times. Uh, Glenn Newton uh, wrote a uh, class book in the Flex series uh, by the same name, and it's got a lot of great ideas that I'll be sharing with you in our future classes. And uh, I just pray that as we go through these things that you will be encouraged so that we can be a people 
of a certain hope in a time of uncertainty. Our class is going to be centered on uh, 1 Peter. And uh, if I could, I'd just like to begin the study by reading just the first few verses of 1 Peter chapter 1. It says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Christ Jesus, for sprinkling with his blood. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. So there are a couple things that I want you to think about there. There are a lot of words uh, about place names that you've never heard of that are relatively unimportant. But, but do note this in these verses. First, uh, the person that is speaking is Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. And we want to get to that. Uh, that's the center of our lesson, talking about Peter himself. And he writes this letter to uh, Christians who are in the dispersion. And I think you should understand from that that they've been dispersed around the world. They're not centered in Judea. And they're in these different places, most likely because of persecution that they've suffered. And Peter wants to give them encouragement in the midst of this persecution so that they'll hang on and they'll be strong. Uh, they are living in their own uncertain times. And he wants to give them a certain hope. And then note in the end of verse 2, it talks, it gives a blessing, and it's a rather standard one, biblically speaking. He says, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. And when you think of them as being people that were under persecution, that's especially appropriate. He says, you have not been experiencing much peace. You've been pressured and pushed and persecuted, but I wish for you peace. So uh, this is the way that he begins this particular letter. And the he, Peter. Let's just talk a minute about uh, this Peter. Somebody were to ask you, who's your favorite biblical character? I'm not sure uh, who, who you would mention. Uh, you might come up with somebody like David. David was a man after God's own heart. Boy, I can identify with that. I want to be a man after God's own heart. And you can read all those beautiful psalms that he writes and you think, boy, I would like to be identified by that as well. And uh, yet it's kind of difficult to identify with David. I mean, David is a man of war. David is a king, uh, many, many wives, uh, um, royal robes and all of that. Well, it's hard for us to identify uh, with royalty in that way. So maybe we would move on. Instead of David, we would say, well, uh, I, uh, I identify with Paul. Now, Paul's another person that you just have to respect. Uh, he is the major writer of the New Testament. Some 13 or 14 books are written by Paul, depending on whether you count Hebrews or not as one of his writings. But uh, uh, as you read about his life, you read in the book of Acts, for example, of the things that he went through, and you think, now there's a man of tremendous faith. And when you read in the epistles, you think, boy, he's a profound thinker. Uh, he's a true scholar. He's a man that really uh, is an encourager of the church. He really spread the faith like no other single person. You see in the missionary journeys an example that, quite frankly, it's hard to identify with because you think, could I have done that? I can't imagine being like Paul in that way. And so though we respect him, maybe it's difficult to identify with him. But there's a third major person that people pick, and that would be Peter. Uh, Peter is someone I can identify with. Peter is a man who uh, uh, the Bible doesn't hide his faults, doesn't hide his failings, doesn't hide uh, the times when uh, he has doubts or times when he speaks up out of turn or when his faith fails and he sinks in the uh, uh, Sea of Galilee because he has little faith or takes his eyes off of Jesus. Uh, we think of him in, in all of these situations as a person who truly uh, is someone who uh, uh, is, is sadly like us uh, far too much. That uh, he is, as someone said, the ultimate man. You know, he uh, is no Superman, but he is somebody who uh, manifested himself as a normal Joe, a normal uh, human being. He's not a king. He's not a biblical scholar. In fact, he was a 
fisherman and you find him in this situation, in many situations, uh, where he acts and reacts very much like maybe you and I would. And, and uh, so, yeah, I can identify uh, with Peter in a way maybe I cannot uh, identify uh, with the other people as well that we've mentioned. So who is this man uh, called Peter? Well, number one, Peter is a man who failed. Peter is a tremendous apostle. And when uh, you read in uh, 1 Peter, the things that he has to say there, quite frankly, you could, without knowing his background, you could think, well, this is a superman. This guy is incredible. And yet, uh, if you look at his earlier life, he wasn't always the same. We need to look at him from the very beginning. And uh, in the beginning, you see uh, a number of times when he was strong and times when he, was, when he failed. He's the Peter who, when Jesus called out for the disciples to follow him, he left his nets, he went off, and he followed Jesus. That took tremendous courage. But sometimes his courage failed him. Uh, his courage didn't always remain. And so when he's out on the Sea of Galilee on one occasion and the storm comes up and he looks over and he sees Jesus uh, uh, out walking on the, on the water, he calls for Jesus to have him come out or to be able to come out and walk on the water to Jesus. But uh, his courage fails him. And the scriptures say that uh, he took his eyes off Jesus and instead looked at the storm around him and he began to drown and so Jesus had to to move in pretty quickly in Matthew chapter 14 and save him it says uh, Peter answered him Lord if it is you command me to come to you on the water and he said come so Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus but when he saw the wind he was afraid and beginning to sink he cried out Lord save me and Jesus immediately reached out his hand took hold of him and saying to him Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. So there are times that this man who begins with courage isn't able to follow through. Hey, that's like me. That's like you. Times when we desire to, to follow Jesus and come to Jesus, but get distracted in our own weakness. And, and look away. And so uh, I can identify the roar of the crowd uh, stole Peter's courage on the night that Jesus was arrested. And so you find uh, him fleeing along with the other disciples as Jesus is taken off and tried uh, by the Sanhedrin. And uh, you follow Peter all the way in the Gospels uh, to uh, the courtyard of the high priest where he's being tried and uh, that sounds really good but during that time when he's mixing it up around the uh, among the crowd he's questioned by those that are somewhat hostile to Christianity and uh, uh, you know they accuse him of being a Galilean one of those followers of Jesus and three times three times he denies that he is a follower and of course, that's been predicted by Jesus that he would do that. But it was another example of where uh, a Peter who has, in so many occasions, has good intentions, isn't able to follow through and he fails and denies uh, the Lord. When you get a little later in the uh, Gospels, uh, you can read in John chapter 21, uh, when Jesus uh, meets uh, with Peter, and uh, the other apostles. Uh, the, the fishermen are there and, and Jesus uh, uh, has that scene where there's a miraculous catch and then they are sitting on the beach after having a fish fry for breakfast and he's alone with Peter and he has an interchange with him. And uh, it says in uh, John 21 verse 15, uh, when they finished breakfast, uh, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, Feed my lambs. Well, I can imagine how difficult it would have been for Peter to have, have been there with Jesus. Uh, still fresh in his mind is his failure 
that uh, three times he had denied that he was a follower of Jesus, had denied the Lord. And so here in this passage, three times Jesus asked the question we just read, uh, Peter, do you love me? And uh, three times Peter responds. Uh, the scholars, they look at this and they say, why was it that Jesus uh, made this question three times? Why did he question him with the same words? And uh, they know that this is the same number of times that Peter had denied Jesus in the first place. And so uh, it's interesting. And you know, I think there is a connection between the three denials and the three questions. Uh, but even though I agree that there is a connection, I don't think Jesus is trying to remind him of his failure alone but rather he's trying to also let him know that he still loves him, that he still has a use for him, that uh, uh, he still has a mission, a task for him to fulfill. Because after every question, uh, do you love me? He says, well then, go feed my lambs the first time, uh, tend my sheep the second time, uh, feed my sheep the third time. Uh, he's saying, listen, yes, I know, you denied me three times, but even though you denied me, I still love you, and I can still use you. And I think this was formative for Peter, you know, to realize that you can be a man who has failed, but still be a person useful to the Lord, and uh, so with us as well, and that's good news. Peter was also a man who grew. And uh, quite frankly, we are kind of witnessed this already uh, in that early in his life, uh, he was much more impetuous than he later is. Uh, he was less of a leader than he becomes in time. Uh, and I think the change in Peter is because the Lord loved him so uh, overwhelmingly. And so he takes this love and he becomes a new person. It's transformative in his life. And uh, it, this changed man from the impetuous disciple of the Gospels becomes the man who on the day of Pentecost, that's the earliest Acts chapter two, uh, is the one who stands up among the apostles and he preaches this tremendous sermon about the crucifixion of Jesus and the fact that Jesus was the Messiah. And the result of that sermon that day is 3,000 people come uh, become Christians and are baptized that day. Hallelujah, yeah? And so uh, I think this is, is part of growth. When you go a little later in the uh, book, you'll get to Acts chapter 12 and verse 6, and, and the scripture says there, um, Now when Herod was about to bring him out, on that very night Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, and sentries before the door were guarding the prison. In this particular uh, story uh, or event, uh, it simply says he was sleeping. And, and you have to think about yourself and myself. I mean, I can get uh, all worked up and hardly be able to sleep when we're just leaving on vacation the next day. Here is Peter anticipating there's a plan to execute him. And uh, what, what's the result? Well, uh, he's sleeping. He feels content. He feels safe. Uh, Whatever is going to happen, he's in the Lord's hands. He's grown from someone who was questioning all the time in the Gospels to someone who is accepting his role here. There are probably a couple things that uh, involve the change. One is, uh, we've already talked about John chapter 21 when he is told to go and feed the, then feed my sheep, Jesus says. So he already has a sense of mission. He's grown in an understanding of why he's on earth. And if he has this mission to feed the sheep, I think he has confidence that he's going to stick around and be able to do that, uh, that the Lord has a use for him and that use is not up yet. 
And then secondly, there's also the words from the ascension. When you get to uh, Matthew chapter 28 and the disciples are gathered around Jesus and he's being uh, taken up to heaven before he goes, uh, he gives the uh, a great commandment. And at the end of the great commandment in uh, Matthew chapter 28 verses 18 through 20, at the end there he says, And lo, I am with you always. I am with you always. And so here he is sleeping between two centuries, and he's able to sleep. He's able to have this kind of faith and trust in God because he believes that God is with him. And thirdly, uh, uh, in addition to, uh, uh, to the two points that we've already pointed out, he, yes, he was a, a failure, but, and yes, he grew. Uh, he's also was a man who loved Jesus. And so we have to go back to John chapter 21 to get this kind of fully. And uh, the interchange where Jesus is saying, um, Simon, uh, let me just read this from the passage. Simon, son of John, do you love me? Uh, every time Jesus, the three times that Jesus asked that, uh, do you love me? Uh, Peter comes back and he says, uh, yes, Lord. I love you, or you know I love you, or whatever. Scholars kind of point out the importance that there's a change of words, that Jesus is using the word agape, and uh, that is a word for love in the Greek language. But Peter is responding when he says, I love you, he's using the word phileo, which is a Greek word for love, but uh, is a has a different slant, a different emphasis. And the difference is this. Uh, some have said, well, agape is, is real Christian love. That's the real word for love. And uh, Jesus is saying, do you love me? Do you agape me? And Peter is responding, well, I phileo you. I, I like you. You know, this is some inferior or lesser form of love. And then you might want to ask the question, if that was true, then would really Jesus turn everything over to a man who uh, responds not that he loves Jesus, but that he just likes him a lot? Uh, and I think it should be obvious that uh, that's not what's being said here. Both words mean love. Agape, however, when Jesus asked, do you love me? He's saying, do you love me with this unconditional love, this love that says you will serve me, you will do whatever it takes. It's this total, absolute, unconditional love. It's what Christian love for God ought to be. Peter means no disrespect at all when he says, uses the word phileo. Phileo is another word for love, but is full of affection. It is a, a word that says, Lord, I love you from the heart. I care about you so very much. When Jesus asks him three times, uh, the passage of scripture says in verse 17, he said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? It says, Peter was grieved because he said to him a third time, do you love me? Peter truly loved the Lord from his heart. Jesus doesn't correct him. Jesus doesn't say when he responds, I phileo you. He doesn't say, oh, no, no that's wrong. You know, I asked agape and you said phileo. No, not at all. Uh, when he hears that uh, Peter is confessing his love, his affection for the Lord, he just tells him, he gives him the task. He says, well, then, uh, then go and feed my sheep. I can use you if you phileo me. If you have this kind of love for me, then go and serve me. That's really the content of agape love, you see. And so uh, when you think about serving God, there are a lot of motivations. Some people are motivated just by the thought that they don't want to go to hell. Uh, they want to uh, avoid punishment. And while that might be motivating to some, it's an inferior motivation to love. Peter has this superior motivation. He loves the Lord. Later in scripture, in 1 John 4 and verse 18, uh, Peter embodied the thought, uh, the motivating thought. He said, perfect love casts out fear. And uh, this perfect love, 
that John talks about in this passage is the love that Peter has for the Lord. Uh, it is the kind of love that we need to have as well. It's the one that will get us through the difficult times and keep us on target. Stories told by uh, uh, Glenn Newton, uh, uh, a captain went out and uh, he took his submarine for a training mission uh, offshore and they were submerged for uh, several days. And uh, when they came back into port, they pulled up to the harbor and, and uh, one of the uh, officers there said to the captain, uh, boy, how did you do with the storm last night? And the captain said, uh, storm? We didn't even know there was a storm. You see, the submarine hat was submerged during that entire time. And when you get down far enough, you get into sort of a, what they call a, a, a cushion of calm, a cushion of the sea, where whatever's going on up above, or whatever kind of storm, any kind of difficulty, any kind of turbulence, you just, it's smooth sailing for you because you're down deep. All of the problem is up there on the surface. A spiritual application to this is for people who have a faith that is surface. Peter, in the beginning of his uh, record in Scripture, has a much more surface faith, and he has a lot more difficulties. Uh, he has more tribulation and turbulence. And so do we as well. When our faith is, is superficial, when it's up there close to the, the storms, those storms are much more troubling than they would be if our faith was much deeper. And so instead of reacting to struggles with strength, uh, we cower in the corner. Uh, instead of reacting to conflict with compassion, uh, we lash out and damage relationships. Uh, instead of reacting to doubts with determination, we raise our white flags. Uh, instead of reacting to pain with peace, we spend restless nights looking for answers. And so that's the result of being too close to the surface of things. There's a point when Peter was there, Peter was at the surface, but as, but as he grew, perfect love cast out fear. And he found his faith at a deeper, le deeper level where he could sail in perfect calm, in the cushion of the sea. And that's where we need to get as well. That's what Peter is encouraging us to have in these difficult times that we live in, to realize that we too can reach a level where we can sail. No matter what is going on up above, whatever storm or tempest is happening, that we can uh, sail calmly and that we can get through it and that we can be all right. Peter says later, in just verse 3, 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has called us to be born again to a living hope. That's what we're going to be talking about in the weeks to come, this living hope. We have hope. In uncertain times, we have a certain hope. You know, I really love David. And you know, I really respect Paul, but I can really identify with Peter. I bet you can too. Look forward to having you back for our future classes. God bless and have a good week. Bye.